honor and a privilege to be here tonight. I always begin with a little icebreaker, so I wanted to ask you all to just take a moment to reflect. What are you grateful for? Close your eyes, take a deep breath, and focus on something positive in your life. And I will share with you why I am grateful. I'm grateful to be here to share my story of rising above life's challenges. And actually, my story began 30 years ago, right here in San Diego, California. What do you know? When I was 10 years old, I accompanied my father to the airport. Little did I know why he was going. All he told me was that he was taking a trip to San Diego to get better, and he would be home very soon. The flight was delayed, and I ran around with my brother, having lots of fun, thinking, why is this taking so long? Little did I know it would be my last time ever seeing him. It pained me for years that I never had a chance to say goodbye. And one year ago, I said these words with Linda Schwartz, who sponsored a very special event, launching Jewish Girls Unite, as you saw in the video, a global movement for Jewish girls. And at that event, I said, I realized today that I wasn't ever meant to say goodbye. Today, I was meant to return to California. This is my third time this year, 30 years later, to bring my father's memory back, to shine his light and share his legacy with all of you today. And so, on behalf of my dear father, I feel sometimes that I am his voice. I take this very special opportunity to express my gratitude to Chabad of San Diego. At that time, I hear there were only two shluchim, Rabbi Leder and Rabbi Fratkin. How much has changed since then? And they were there for my father. I think he was here about six weeks to two months. He wasn't well enough to even come home in his last days. And I know that they provided physical, spiritual, emotional support in those last moments of his life. And so it's really a privilege to be able to say thank you. And this is the work of Chabad. And it's just incredible to see how much Chabad has grown. And I really wish you continued success and continued blessings in all your work. And I'm sure my father is blessing you from above as well. Amen. At this time, I do want to say that I learned from my mother to rise above life's challenges and really thank her for being the one to continue to raise her four children one of them was born after my father. Two months later, and his name is Azriel Yitzchak, the son of Azriel Yitzchak. And my mother really went out of her way to, to do everything possible to raise us in a home where we would follow in my father's footsteps and of course carry on his legacy and as well as follow in the ways of our Father above, Hashem. And so, thank you, Ma. <laughs> thank you, Saraleya, for organizing this tonight. You've been more than a sister-in-law, always believing in the, in the work that we do, coming out to Irvine last year, and you see where the journey has taken us. I want to tell you that a year ago, it was difficult for me to say those words in public, to talk about my father. And Linda held my hand and I felt so supported, I said, there's a reason that I'm here. I never believed that one year later, I would have the courage to share my full story with you. Because in this past year, I have really discovered the story in myself and allowed myself to grieve, to cry the tears that I never cried. And in that process, I have discovered my father's love and joy in my life today. And like I say, I found nechama, I found comfort. I always used my journal as a safe place to express my feelings. 
And on Hanukkah, December 11, 2012, I wrote an entry called A Song That Struck a Chord. And so this is what I wrote in the journal. That I, You know what my name of my journal was? I called it Never Alone. Often, loss causes us to feel lonely. It's, it's not even rational. We could be surrounded by people and, loved, and lots of people who love us. But there's this feeling in our heart of loneliness. And so I called it Never Alone as a reminder that Hashem is always with me and I'm never alone. And I would write moments in my life where I really saw Hashem's hand. On that day, I was going through music and somehow I discovered this song called Don't Ever Leave. I had never heard it before. It was an old Hanel Ofelik song. And I played the song and I tell you, I cried. I have the song here to play for you. And of not being given the chance to say goodbye. And I was carrying around the sadness since the day I kissed him goodbye. I would have never let go of him. It is significant that the day that I heard the song was Hanukkah. And Tati, I wrote this letter to him. I remember how you lit your candles with joy. And then we sat down on the floor and you played your guitar and you sang songs to us. I miss you. May the lights of Hanukkah bring the light of redemption. Little did I realize that I was also asking Hashem for personal redemption from being stuck in the pain of the past. It was essential for me to grieve and acknowledge the loss in order to mend a broken heart. At 10 years old, I wasn't really given a chance to cry. I didn't really understand. There were so many presents, so many wonderful people taking care of us. On Hanukkah, we are commanded to light the Hanukkah menorah in the dark. What does that mean? It is necessary to face the darkness in order to bring out the light. And what is the light that comes from darkness? A much greater light. And so I played this song over and over until these tears really released all the pain, a lot of the sadness. And just like an olive needs to be crushed to extract the light for the menorah, the oil for the menorah, when I cried, I felt so much better. And I really began to open my heart to extract this light from the darkness. 
often a song can help us bring buried emotions to the surface and it's actually healthy to cry and let it out. See yourself walking through a dark tunnel. Don't stop. Know that Hashem is holding your hand. You're not alone. He is guiding every step. You're getting closer and closer to the light. And then you're there. And the light is so bright. And that's really what happened to me. Our experiences and our memories are tainted by so much sadness that we avoid the subject. And we don't share the stories of our loved ones. And so we create this wall between the past and the present. Memories are lost. But if we could allow the beauty of the person's life, we would feel a sense of freedom and joy. And this is the meaning to me of Zecher Liyetzias Mitzrayim. In remembrance lies the key to redemption. When we remember, we go out of our personal limitations and we experience true freedom. I am blessed to remember my father, even though I was just 10 years old. My father spent so much quality time with me that I have many, many stories with him and so many positive memories. And one time, actually it was during the engagement of my brother Azriel, his bride said to me, you know, everywhere we go, I, I notice that my brother says who he is. You know, what's your name? Oh, you're Azriel. Oh, Azriel Wasserman? Oh, I knew your father. Oh, wow, what an incredible man he was. And my sister-in-law, now she says, he doesn't even know the legacy he's carrying. He has no idea who this man is. He never met him. He never heard stories about him. And it hit me. And I said, wow, who is going to be the one to pass on these memories? That day I made a commitment to revive my father's memory. I would do all in my power to make sure that my father would not be forgotten, not to his children, his grandchildren, and to the world. <coughs> and so on July 9, 2013, we gathered family and friends and had our first live broadcast from New York, but that one was the 27th Yardside Gathering for my father, and I invited many people who knew him. And all these speakers recalled his life's teachings and how he impacted them as if no time had gone by. It was pretty incredible. And my own daughter, who actually just became a Kala, and we have a wedding on June 15th, so my father's legacy is strong, thank God. She wrote in her college application, in a large crowded room, I sat mesmerized, listening to the memories and testimonies about my grandfather, Rabbi Azriel Yitzchak Wasserman, from his family, friends, and students. A short yet complete life, he lived each day dedicated to his passions and affected all those around him. Among his many roles and interests, one that stands out was his dedication to the field of education. With his unwavering excitement, passion, and joy, he touched the lives of many students who will never forget him. He influenced people not only by the scope and grasp of his knowledge, but by his dedication and his sincerity. I am proud to carry on his legacy. And this is what my daughter wrote. Now, what does this have to do with all of you? Every Pesach, we gather with our family and we share the story to our children so that they don't forget their past and they remember that they also carry a rich heritage, a legacy that is to be treasured. It's the legacy of thousands of years, a history that has stories of bitterness and joy. It is our treasure that we keep alive in our children, and it's up to us, the women. We know that. And Pesach reminds us that we have the power to share these stories, even when they are bittersweet. Tell the stories of our parents, grandparents, and go way back and teach them that they too can overcome challenges and rise above, rise above it just like their ancestors did. And at this memorial gathering, a student of my father, a student that had been, it was 30 years later, she showed up and she said, I've been holding on to this 
These are notes from your father's last classes to women in Machon Chana, a, an institute that teaches Jewish women who are, newly, who are learning about their heritage. My father would give night classes, and I would remember staying up for him because I wanted to get his kiss goodnight, even though it was late, and I would wait up for him so that I would say Hamapil with him, the prayer before we go to sleep. And, I always, and he would say, you're still up? And I would say, yes! And I always waited for those nights. But I remember that he taught those classes. 27 years later, I would be handed this treasure. Now I wonder sometimes, why wasn't it given to me earlier? And I know the answer, because I wasn't ready. And I opened up to the last page of the notes, curious to see what would be the last paragraph and what would be the last lesson he ever taught. The topic of his class was, the power of thought rise above life's challenges. <laughs> and in the last class that he ever gave, this is what he said. If a chassid developed a potentially fatal illness, it would not change him. It would motivate him to work harder, to overcome negative thoughts, and recognize the greater need to bring more positivity into his life. Little did his students know that he was fighting for his life. He didn't tell anybody, and they never would have known because he lived every day with positivity and joy. He really lived what he taught. So how do we stay positive? And this is what our topic is tonight. How do we live this way? And let me tell you, when I read those notes, I had the same question. I said, how do I live this way? Why am I I'm upset about these little things that are not going well in my life? And here my father was able to live with this. I yearned to understand his secret. And there were some other pointers in the notes which I'll just mention to you, but even reading them, you know how you can read something but still not get it? It's just up here. Or where does it really need to get to? The mind can know, but the heart doesn't feel. And until we create that mind-heart connection, it just stays up there, and we still get upset. And the negative emotions still take us over. And so I was very intrigued by some of his tools that he taught them. One of them was how to think positive. Fill your mind with Torah thoughts. Negative thoughts are attracted to an empty mind. So if you connect your mind to Hashem, it gives you the power to be positive. And it pushes away the negativity. Another one was fight negativity with self-talk. Ask yourself, what am I thinking right now? Am I aware of my thoughts? And live consciously at being aware of the thoughts that we choose at every moment. And then another tool was mental relaxation and visualization, because when we visualize, we enable healing energy to flow through our body and we calm down. We calm that heart that is sometimes takes over. Start your day off right with the power of prayer and meditation. Prayer can influence your entire day, and it gives energy that your mind should rule your heart. I began to study these notes with my wonderful husband, Sir Leah's brother, Avraham, Rabbi Avraham Labor, who's home with the children right now, so thank you, Rabbi Labor, for letting me, Avraham. I'm only here because of him. You know, like they say, you owe everything. <laughs> behind, behind me is a great man, let me tell you. And he really... Oh, learned these notes with me because some of them I didn't get the sources that you know it was hard to understand he knew all the sources and we went back to the sources and we really studied it but still guess where it was only in my head and we even wrote an essay for Rabbi Simon Jacobson's essay contest called Hasidus Applied and I was very excited and he did half of it but I still got all the credit <laughs> because my name was on it <laughs> and so we 500 essays were submitted, and we were chosen as number 18. And it was called The Power of Thought, and you can read it on his website. And I said, I don't care that I wasn't the top three. I know number 18 is what I wanted. My father's teachings are alive. They're chai v'kayam. 
One of the stories we like to share about my father during Pesach is a very beautiful story. This story took place when in, in his first years of teaching, he was a volunteer at the Release Time program in Brooklyn, where public school children are taken out of class for one hour a week, and volunteers come and teach them about their heritage. And this is for all religions. So the Jewish kids get a rabbi, the Christian kids get a priest, and this is how it went. And my father was, as you see, a very gifted teacher. And it was before Pesach, and he decided to do a model Seder. And so instead of grape juice, he had Kool-Aid, and instead of matzah, he had crackers. And the kids loved it. And, one of the, and the next day, a week later, he also went back during the intermediate days of Pesach. And he noticed in his class, there were two <laughs> little girls who were sisters. They kept falling asleep. They just couldn't keep their eyes open. And he was wondering, and he kept saying to them, are you okay? And they said, yeah. Towards the end of the class, they hinted that, they, yes, they would like to speak to him. And so he asked them, what's going on? You seem very tired today. And they said, we'll, we'll tell you what happened, but would you promise that you won't tell anybody? Do you promise? And he stared at them and he said, of course, I won't tell anybody. The girls looked at each other one more time. They were still a bit nervous. And they said, well, you remember last week we had that practice Seder? Well, if you remember, my sister asked you, why are you doing all these things? And you answered that Hashem is good and God loves us and he took us out of Egypt. And so God wants us to make a Seder to remember that he loves us. And do you know that that day we went home and we decided that we want to make a Seder? And we asked our mom, can we have our Seder? And our mom thought for a moment that that would be a good idea. And then we went over to dad and we said, dad, who isn't Jewish, can we have a Seder? And dad did not like that idea. And dad got really angry at mom because he thought it was her idea. And we got really scared. And then he turned to us and he said, if you mention that again, you're going to get a spanking. And we went back and we had a meeting with two little sisters and they said, if God wants us to do it, we're going to do it. We're going to have a Seder. We're not going to take no for an answer. And if anybody knows me, that's my motto. <laughs> so we figured out a plan. We took money from our piggy bank and the next day we went to the store and we bought grape juice. And the next day after school, we bought some matzah. And we discovered, we found some lettuce in the fridge and we hid all of this in the basement. And we waited for Pesach night. We pretended to go to sleep. We waited for our parents to be fast asleep. And we crawled out of bed. We lit a flashlight. And we went down to the very dark and scary basement. And let me tell you, he, she said, it was so scary, and sometimes there are rats in that basement, but we did it anyways. And we lit two candles in that dark and scary basement, and we did everything you told us, Rabbi. We, we ate the matzah, and then we drank the four cups, and we thanked Hashem that we are his children. And then you know what we did the next that night? We did the same thing. But this time, they said we weren't as scared. We even laughed a little bit. And they finished their story, and they said, please remember not to tell anybody. Our father will break our bones. And they left their teacher. And my father, Rabbi Wasserman, told this story to his friend, actually, Tovia Bolton. And he said to his friend, you know, I sat down at my teacher's desk, and I put my head down, and I cried. And my father said, those little girls, they put me in my place because I don't know if I would have had the courage to do what they did. What is Pesach really all about? It's not only about what Hashem did for us, but it's about us having the courage to go out of our own personal limitations. And the word Mitzrayim in Hebrew doesn't just mean Egypt. It really means boundary, limitation, where we feel trapped. That's what Mitzrayim is. 
how do we get unstuck? How do we leave our personal Egypt? We say it every day, but not always do we understand what this means. And so as I began to discover my own story, it opened up old wounds and a lot of raw emotion. And I needed the tools to deal with this sadness, with this real buried sadness, that it didn't go away. Hashem, thank God, sent me lifeboats. He sent me people who helped me discover how to apply those notes from my father, how to live it. They coached me, they helped me, and taught me tools that now I'm able to teach others. And after almost three decades of carrying around this pain in my heart, I have really learned to replace it with the love and joy that my father shared with the world. I discovered this little girl, this 10-year-old girl, Nechamadina Wasserman, living inside of me. And I was told that there's this, that because our heart doesn't really know time, once there's an emotional breakage, the heart actually gets stuck in that time period. But often if we go back to the time that we were a child, we go back to the same place, or if we go back home and we remember a sad experience or a loss, we, we're not really experiencing the true joy. So how do we really get past that? The way we learn to go out of our own personal Egypt is by understanding the story exactly the way the Jews went out of Egypt. That's how we can go out of our own personal Egypt. We could apply every single part of the story to our lives. So the first thing is, Moshe says to Paro, let my people go. And Paro says, no, no way, you're not going. And we think Paro is a voice of the past. Uh-uh. There's the Paro, he's alive and well, he's inside of us. It's that voice that tells us, no, you cannot let go of that grudge. No, you cannot let go of that sadness. No, you cannot do that. Who do you think you are? You're not enough. Other people are better than you. Those are the voices of Paro inside of us. And when we listen to those negative thoughts, we're still trapped into our Egypt. Pesach really gives us the strength to let go of those thoughts. So how do we do it? And actually, it's interesting, one more little point about the word Paro. Paro is spelled pei resh i and he. If you change the order of those letters, you can get ha O ref, which really means the back of the neck. So really what Paro represents is the blockage between our mind understanding something and our heart feeling it. And so one of the first teachers, after many others, who helped me unblock was a woman by the name of Susan Axelrod. She's a personal coach and she helped me speak to that inner child and she said, what I need to do is address that little girl and harmonize the adult and the child. So the knowing adult's mind can talk to the feeling heart of the child. And so what did she do? She was moved to write me this meditation one night at 11 o'clock at night. And this is what she wrote to me and instantly I felt like a different person. So I'll share this with you and you can apply it because there's a little girl inside all of us. It's time to let it go, let it heal, and replace that sadness with love and joy. When you can, find a quiet place. Get quiet and breathe deeply. Close your eyes, breathe again a few times. Keep your eyes closed and ask Hashem for strength. Go inside and find your 10-year-old self. Tell her you love her. Ask her if it's okay to hold her. When she nods yes, hold her close and let her feel your heart beating. Tell her she is okay. Tell her that she is a strong and special girl and she will grow up and find a wonderful man who will love her for who she is. Tell her she will use her father's strength and kindness and truth to lead others. Tell her that, is, that it is okay to be mad that dad left her, and, and it is okay to be lonely and sad, and that she will find strength. Hold her and feel her in your arms. 
You may start to cry and even sob. If you do, tell the little girl that you're crying now because you're so happy. That it's okay to cry. She should not worry about you any longer. You are okay. She can be in peace now knowing that it all turned out well. Tell her she may come visit you anytime. Be sure to get her permission to remind her that she can visit when she wants. Say goodbye and then come back to consciousness. You have been carrying around that sad and scared little girl in you for 30 years. You tried to make it all okay, but it never really was. Use this meditation to make it okay now. All is well, friend, sending you love. That just did something to me, and I definitely cried, and I cried through it, as you can imagine. There's another woman by the name of Miriam Yushalmi, and actually she's coming out with a book of prayer meditations, which are incredible. Another way to get our mind and our heart to become friends and really work together, and then we speak from our heart, but the heart is love and joy. And I really began to remove the protection around my heart that was sadness, and then I just opened up my heart, which is really why I can stand here before you to share my story. So one of the things that Miriam Yushalmi did was part two of this meditation, that we all have that inner child, that it's healthy to bond with her and love her and remind her that Hashem loves her. Reassure her that she's a gift of God to the world, a precious soul. Tell her you are a gift of God to the world. You begin to see a deep smile of contentment and security. The feeling of warmth surrounds the two of you. Something very powerful is happening. A wonderment is in the ear. You take hold of her and the bonding continues to grow. Hand in hand, the ways of nourishing comfort lands right into the heaviness of your heart. The armor that was once around your heart begins to melt. Your heart begins to heal and mend and soften. The love and sweetness of this child helps you to begin anew. You feel more alive. Something is shifting in you, a new powerful healing from this amazing moment of bonding. You begin to walk together, holding each other's hand, not letting go. You feel blessed. You feel safe. This safe, loving place has helped you do important healing work, and you are always better for this. You are never alone. This acceptance and love has helped you. You feel free, free to be you, free to be alive, and you say to yourself, let's all say this together, God loves me. I love me. I love me. I love me. Again, I love me. I love me. Forever. Forever. And remind that child that no matter what happened, even if it didn't get the love that it needed as a child, for whatever reason it was, that now is the time that you could nurture and be your own mother and father and love that little girl inside all of us. And it's amazing what happens. When I walked into Sarlea's house today, I noticed this beautiful rose bush and I said, oh, I need a rose. <laughs> you won't believe why. The second thing that I learned how to go out of my own personal pain was I learned from the story of Moshe standing in front of the, the sned, the burning bush, and Hashem appeared to him. It was called a thorn bush. And our commentaries ask, why did God appear to Moshe in a thorn bush? Why not any other kind of tree? And the answer is because God said to him, I will be as I will be. Remember. Even in your most prickly, thorny moments, those very difficult times, please remember that I will be with my children. I am with them, and it's a double terminology. I will be with them now in the present exile in Egypt, and I will also be with them in the future. I always teach in my bat mitzvah lessons, to the, Jew, to the girls that a Jewish woman like Rivka was considered a rose amongst thorn. And really all Jewish people were considered a rose amongst thorn. Hashem calls us his rose. And why is that? 
Because no matter what, even when we're surrounded by negativity, by the evil in the world, we stand and we rise above it. And the smell and the scent of the rose generates joy and beauty to the world. This is the Jewish people. No matter how difficult life may be, we stand above it. We are that rose. Mm -hmm. And actually, this happened in San Diego. So I found out what my father's last lesson was. I also recently found out what my father's last words were. And the grandparents of a camper at the Jewish Girls Retreat happened to tell me I, w I used to live in California, Rabbi Mendel Shigalov. He was one of the people to visit my father in the hospital. And he said that I was going home and feeling stressed just from normal life. And here your father was just had this inner calm and inner peace. And he says, he says, I don't understand. Azriel, tell me, how is it possible that you have this disposition? And my father turned to him and he said, Mendel, kok nish eif de ve, kok eif de gesund. He says, Mendel, stop focusing on the pain. Focus on the positive. Focus on the health. Why do we just tend, we just tend to focus on the thorns in our life? as opposed to realizing that there are so many roses in our garden. And that was really the message. And I wrote this poem because everything changed for me. Once I discovered that I could transform that darkness into light, it, it didn't just apply to my connection with my father. It was in every area of my life. I actually started noticing more of the positive in my husband and in my children and in my and people around me, I started to see differently because our mind is, is like a magnet. And darkness attracts darkness. Dark thoughts will just attract the darkness in other people. And light, if we decide to be positive, we will see positivity around us. We will attract positivity to us. Did you ever notice if you're just having a bad day, everything goes wrong? Why does that happen? It's, it's a mirror. It's all about how, what we're really focusing on. And that's what we attract to ourselves. And sometimes when our heart just gets emotional and upset, we don't even realize that we're in that pattern. And then sometimes we just need that reminder. We can control those thoughts, but it really does take, it takes mindfulness and consciousness to really live in that way. So I actually wrote a little poem in my journal. And actually, I shared this one to thank Susan for just helping me see things differently. I used to feel like a rose amongst thorns. The roses in my garden were hard to see. I focused on the pain of the sharp thorns. Today, I learned how to be free. I learned to appreciate the beauty of each rose and take the time to nurture each seed. I thank Hashem for the tools to succeed. I view the thorns as a symbol of strength and protection. And I accept the thorns and say, it's all okay. I see how everything in my life is God's perfection. I choose to see the beauty in the thorns each day. For, for anyone can see the beauty in a rose, but it takes a great mind, heart, and soul to see the beauty in the thorns. Every time we go through a situation that feels like a thorn, just remember that every rose only grew because of those thorns. We, we're in Egypt so that we could grow into the Jewish nation, so that we could receive the Torah. So every challenge is really a strength if we only will it to be. I actually wrote this poem and I decided to put a picture of my father because it really represented my whole new attitude to life. I put a picture of my father with the poem, which isn't here. And then I gasped because I never ever noticed this frame in this picture that I just loved my smile in. And I was like, oh, Tati, you're talking to me again. He was saying to me, I'm so happy that you're not focusing on the thorns. You're not just focused on the pain. You see the roses now, finally. And I know I felt it, my father's saying to me. I was with you in your pain, and you lifted me with you out of your pain. Thank you. I knew I did it for him, too. Once the Jews went out of Egypt, what was the next step? What was the first stop out of Egypt? 
finally we think we're out of our Egypt, let go of all the past, the, the pain, of the limitations. Yay, we're so proud of ourselves. And what happened to the Jews? They're standing in front of a huge sea. And behind them is the negativity of Egyptians. And all around them is the opinions of many, many loud, argumentative Jews. <laughs> what are we going to do here? We finally went out of Egypt. Come on, give us a break, God. You put us in front of a sea, and sure enough, we have all the opinions. Some Jews say, let's just go back. We really like that emotional chaos. It feels a lot better because suddenly we're out of Egypt. It's like, what does this mean now? What do we do with this new feeling of joy and love? Like That also sometimes creates a new beginning. We need to get used to that. And so... Other Jews said, let's just give up. Forget it. We don't want to live anymore. And then there were other ones said, let's just keep crying. Let's keep praying. And there was one Jew who knew the answer. Only one. He said, what does God want of me? There's no time now for even crying, for praying. You cried in Egypt. Grieving <coughs> is over. Time to move forward. Time to take action. Time to see the goal. And the goal is to receive the mission from God at Mount Sinai. We're going to that mountain, people. And he jumped into that sea, and lo and behold, the sea split for him. Ben, was that? I had a vision of what my mission was, and that was to help Jewish girls connect, unite, and feel supported in their challenges. To create a safe place online where girls can ask questions, find their talents, express it for a wide audience of Jewish girls from around the world. But I could tell you, I told many people this idea. And many people were like those Jews standing in front of the sea. It's not going to work. Give it up. Just do what you're doing. Why aren't you just happy with what you are doing? And I had this deep yearning to do something, something that would really carry on my father's legacy. And there were a couple people in my life, and one of them is sitting right here. Her name is Linda, who came an hour and a half from Irvine. And Linda's daughters were in Jewish Girls Retreat, and we spoke about this idea. And Linda was the fuel and the passion, and she believed in it. She said, let's jump into the sea. Let's do it. And Susan Axelrod is now our JGU strategic consultant. In the process, JGU has really helped me leap over many of limitations with the support and help of an, a wonderful team of Jewish women literally from around the world. And as I say, today we're uniting Jewish girls literally from across the seas. So really, what is Pesach? It's the holiday of our freedom. Freedom to be our true selves, to live our true purpose. This road to happiness is not always easy to find. It really is an incredible journey. And I'm really grateful to Hashem for sending me the people to teach me these tools that helped me mend and create a whole heart again. Recently, one of my father's friends said to me, it's as if your father has never left you. And that is the simple truth. I live with his light every day. It's a life of joy, not of sadness and loss. And this new light is really spreading around the world, actually in the form of Jewish Girls Unite, which is the global community for Jewish girls. So I really want to also invite you all to join this community. It's basically focused on girls 8 to 18, but we also invite women to share their wisdom. And here there's a whole audience from around the world, and it's not just for today, it's for all times. Their writings will be preserved and be an inspiration for all Jewish girls. So I welcome you to join this community so that we can actually stay connected. So I wanted to end off with a song, a beautiful song by another woman. Her name is Rifka Leah, and her songs were also part of my healing journey. A song called Amen, and that where we see all the blessings in our life. Every time you find strength in the words that you hear, every time that you see the clouds start to clear, Every time that you make